Good morning. Today we're starting a series on the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. As you probably know, it's very different from the rest of the New Testament. There's really no other book quite like it. It can be hard to understand. And so today we're going to begin by a bit of orientation to think about what this book is and the, ask the question of who it's about and to find out when it's talking about and uh, how are we supposed to respond. Those four questions, the what, the who, the when, and the how are we to respond. Those are the things we'll be looking at as we look at chapter one together. Before we do, let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus. He is the living word. And through him, we are able to come to you. And we come to you now through this chapter, through Revelation chapter one of your word. And we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and help us to understand and to see clearly and to draw near to you and be renewed and strengthened by your word. So speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin by taking a look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And here's what it says in the Greek New Testament. The first three words begin like this, Apocalypsis Jesu Christu, or the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or that first word in Greek is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Apocalypse, that's the word that we translate as revelation. Apocalypse is a word people are using a lot right now to describe this global crisis that we're in. And it's uh, that word that's used oftentimes in the sense of something uh, cataclysmic happening in our world, like an asteroid strike or like aliens invading, the kinds of things that used to take us to the movie theater in the summertime and keep us on the edge of the seat. And certainly what we are experiencing right now is a massive cataclysm affecting our world. There are nearly 330,000 deaths globally and about a third of them here in our country. So yes, uh, if apocalypse describes a global calamity, well then, in that sense, we are living through an apocalypse right now. But that's not what John meant by the word apocalypse as he began to write this last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation does not, in fact, describe a future global catastrophe. It is rather the end of the catastrophe, the end through God's redemption of our broken world. Neither aliens, nor asteroids, nor even the coronavirus caused the problem that we're suffering through. It was us. We broke our world. We did it by rebelling against God. But behold, God is making all things new. That's what the book of Revelation teaches us. Revelation will show us that he's doing it through Jesus Christ and through his bride. So that's why we're turning to Revelation right now, not to pile on with more catastrophes, to load up even more, but in fact, to get some very good news about a happy ending that's yet to come. So why then did John begin this book with the word apocalypse if he wasn't trying to warn us about a future global catastrophe? Well, this Greek word apocalypse means to reveal or to unveil, to uncover. And John put this word up front as the, the beginning of the book because that's his goal for everything that follows in the next 22 chapters. That's truly how the book of Revelation works. It's an uncovering of what's been hidden, revealing that which has been veiled in order to help us see things as they really are, just as God sees them from his perspective above the fog of sin and death in our world. Now, sometimes an apocalypse can be a lot of fun. It can be really good news, finding out, for example, what's inside that gift that's wrapped under the tree for you. Think, for example, of what fun it will be when we finally take possession and move into this church building that we've been praying for and raising money for and working so hard to buy now for years. Uh, up until now, we haven't been able to go into it together. And so we have a lot of uh, mental images of what it must be like. 
that we haven't been able to see it. So it's been covered. It's been veiled. It's been hidden. When moving day comes, it will be apocalyptic. I hope it won't be apocalyptic in a bad way, but I hope that it will be a wonderful unveiling and a wonderful good sense of the word uh, that we'll finally be able to go in together and we'll be able to see what it's really like and we'll be able to experience it, putting aside those preconceived mental images and allowing them to give way to seeing it clearly and being able to use it finally for the glory of the Lord. So that's one way that apocalypses work. Another way that they work is sometimes not very good news, but nevertheless good news we really need to know. Like if you're feeling sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor runs tests and then is able to come back with the news that reveals what's going on, whether it's some kind of imbalance or an infection or a malignancy. And um, it's not welcome news, but nonetheless important news, news that we need to know. Uh, consider, for example, the apocalyptic nature of rach racial violence when it is seen in our country. Um, you know, white people can be blissfully unaware of the degree of racism in our country, the severity of the problem. But then something, uh, some kind of evidence makes its way into the mainstream media. And then that evidence is apocalyptic. It reveals what's actually going on. Think back to the 1950s with the brutal murder of Emmett Till, or all the way to today with the video that just came out regarding Ahmaud Arbery's death. These things are gruesome, they're tragic, and yet they play an important role of unveiling what's actually happening. We need to know what's happening so that we can grieve and so that we can call for justice and put a stop to the violence. And God help us to do so in this particular case. So that's the way unveiling works in the book of Revelation. Sometimes it's really good news. Sometimes it's hard news, but news that we need to know. And that's what John is up to as he writes this book, with both the good and the bad, helping us understand what's really happening so we can keep in step with the Lord and his renewal of all things. So that's the what of Revelation. Now what about the who? Who is being unveiled in this book? And again, John's opening words are really important in verse 1. Again, the apocalypsis of Jesu Christu. That is the apocalypse or revelation of Jesus Christ. And it, that's exactly what we find in this book. It is the revealing, the unveiling of Jesus. We've already begun to experience this in today's reading of chapter 1. The Jesus described in this chapter looks very different from the way that he's often portrayed. I want to show you a picture right now of the way that he often comes up. Uh, if you Google images of Jesus, this is the sort of thing that you'll see. This is what I call Jesus milk toast, And uh, he's doe-eyed, he's placid, perhaps a comforting friend if you're really very sad, yet hardly an impressive figure otherwise. But now compare Jesus' milk toast to Christ in majesty in this picture. I remember the first time that I saw this picture when I went into the Basilica here in Brookland, and I was stunned. I looked up, saw this mosaic, and, uh, I, and tears came to my eyes as I saw it. Because even though this is a lot more Northern European than Middle Eastern, um, this Jesus is impressive. This is the Jesus that we've read about, who conquered the grave, and who now rules as king, and will live forever, and is Lord of Lords. This is the Jesus who has risen from the dead and is worthy of our allegiance. But images such as this one remain hidden, while the doe-eyed, milquetoast Jesus is everywhere. So, thanks for that. So, you know what we need? We need an apocalypse. We need an unveiling of the true Lord Jesus Christ, like what happened in the Gospels uh, at the time of the transfiguration of Jesus. Maybe you remember that story. Jesus kept telling his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to be crucified and would rise again after three days. It was scary and disorienting news, but Jesus' transfiguration was apocalyptic. It showed uh, who he really was, 
and was intended to give them courage and hope and faith to go through the crucifixion on to his resurrection. It was there to help the disciples believe the word of the Lord and be able to follow him through the crisis that was yet to come. Now here in Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 10, we see Jesus for the first time since the ascension, and he's looking a lot like he did in the transfiguration. Like today, it was a Sunday, it was the Lord's day, and John was worshiping the Lord in the Spirit. And then he heard a loud voice commanding him to write down this vision and send it to the seven churches. So John turned around, verse 12, to see who was speaking, and he saw a vision of Jesus dressed like a temple priest, walking in the heavenly temple surrounded by these seven large lampstands like golden trees set aflame. What's Jesus doing there? And what does this vision mean? Well, over the past several weeks as we've talked about the Great Commission and about Jesus' ascension, one of the puzzles that we've heard is this promise that Jesus says, I'm going away, but I'm also going to stay with you. Now, how does that work? Um, and we see here how it's possible for Jesus to be with us and also to be with the Father, because it's not so much about him being in two places as it is about us being in two places, as we are carried with him into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, by the blood of Jesus, we are washed and made clean and carried with him into the presence of God because of our union with him. So we are welcomed in, welcomed in among the lampstands, welcomed into the most holy place, safe in the presence of God Almighty. Yet we see all of this through a glass dimly, especially now when we can't gather for worship, we can't sing together, we can't process together into the Lord's presence, we can't feast together at the Lord's table. We're not breaking bread as they did on the road to Emmaus, and they were able to finally see Jesus in the breaking of bread. So Jesus himself remains veiled. And what we need is an apocalypse of Jesus Christ, another unveiling like the Transfiguration story, and the Emmaus story to help us see Jesus' glory so that we can persevere in the midst of a trying time. And that's what John gave us in this chapter. And starting in verse 14, he gives us a sevenfold description of Jesus in his glory. Jesus transfigured again for us. Betsy did such a great job with this in her children's lesson, all I have to do is just recap these seven things that she's already covered. Starting in verse 14, Jesus is our Savior, whose hair is white like the wool of the spotless lamb that he is. The second, he's our lover. He's the jealous lover of the bride, his church, symbolized by the lampstands, and his eyes are also aflame, like flames of fire, reflecting his passion for the bride. Then in verse 15, thirdly, Jesus is the mighty king, his feet are like burnished bronze, like the great emperors of the ancient world. Fourthly, he's the wise commander-in-chief. His voice is like a roaring waterfall, the living word rushing from his voice. And he guides and direct us, directs us through it. Verse 16, he's our protector as he holds his churches as seven stars in his powerful right hand. Sixthly, he's also the righteous judge whose tongue is a double-edged sword. His word brings justice to restore all things. And finally, he's the glorious bridegroom who will not rest until his bride shares in his glory. His face shines like the sun, as we read in the Psalms, like a bridegroom coming from his chamber, rejoicing to run his race for his bride. Isn't this just the kind of apocalypse that we need right now? In the midst of the pandemic, no more Jesus milk toast, no more wimpy Jesus. A Jesus who is just a nice guy, gives good advice, but really isn't able to help us. Here instead is Christ in majesty, our risen and ascended Lord, and he deserves honor and praise, worthy of our worship. If there's any doubt how we ought to respond, we'll look at how John responds in verse 17 
After seeing Jesus unveiled in this way, he fell at Jesus' feet as if he were dead. John, who had spent all those years in friendship and discipleship following Jesus, now, when he sees him in his glory, falls down before him and worships him. But just like Betsy showed us with the nifty action figure Jesus, who's bendy, and he gets up, uh, Jesus puts his hand on John and lifts him up, uh, foreshadowing the resurrection of all those who believe in him. And listen to what Jesus said. Don't be afraid, John, verse 17. I am the first and the last, verse 18. I'm the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Verse 19, therefore write these things that you have seen and those that are and those that will take place after this. This brings us to, to another very important question, the question of when. The question of when these things will take place. What time is being revealed in John's apocalypse? And when Jesus says that he is the first and the last and the living one, it's already the third time in this chapter that we have heard him and his father described in this way. That is, being alive in the past, will be alive in the future, and alive in the present. In the gospel, Jesus spoke of himself in this way at different times, presumably because God the Father spoke of himself in this way at the burning bush. You remember perhaps Moses asking, who should I say sends me to Egypt to speak to Pharaoh, to speak to the people who were enslaved there? And God said, I'm Yahweh, I'm the great I am, the living one. And Jesus uses that same kind of language to describe himself in the Gospels. And now again, we see him described in this way. Uh, the one who has in fact conquered the grave and is now alive forevermore. He holds the keys to death and the grave. So he is alive, past, present, and future. And so what that means in terms of the time of the book of Revelation is that contrary to popular opinion, Revelation is not primarily a book about the future. Revelation is not a timetable of events of how the world is going to come to a crashing halt. It's rather an insider's view of God's restoration of all things, something that began long, long ago. And so many of the things that are described in the book of Revelation have already happened. So we've already seen, it talks about Jesus' death and his resurrection and his ascension. Some things were past from John's perspective, some things were present from John's perspective, and some things were yet future from John's perspective. Many of those things now, though, are in our past. Just as an example, what gets unveiled in this chapter isn't the distant future, but not long after the ascension. Remember last week we read from Acts chapter 1 about the ascension of Jesus from the perspective of the disciples. Now this week in Revelation chapter 1, we are seeing the ascension from the other side, as it were, from, from the perspective of heaven, what uh, the people in, what the saints in heaven would have seen uh, with Jesus' ascension. So again, what we're seeing in today's passage is not a vision of Jesus in the far off distant future. This is rather very old news from the distant past. It's the way Jesus has looked for over 2,000 years. Yet it's still very timely news, especially right now. We need this vision of Jesus in majesty in order to believe his word and follow him through this crisis. So one more question, the question of how. How can we make use of this book during a time of global catastrophe? Well, let's do what Betsy says to the kids in her lessons. Let's wonder together. <laughs> We've seen that this is an apocalypse of Jesus Christ. We've seen in chapter 1, Jesus unveiled in full glory as he was long ago after the ascension. Let's wonder together. I wonder what the rest of this book is about. We've already seen Jesus in full glory in chapter 1. What could, be cha what could chapters 2 through 22 be about? Well, the answer is one of the most stunning things in the whole Bible. It's a big shocker of revelation, perhaps even more surprising than an asteroid strike or an alien invasion. Can you guess what's left in the rest of Revelation, chapters 2 through 22? It's about Jesus better half. 
the church, the bride of Christ, the union of all of us who believe in him, not as we are now, but as we will be when we are grown up in every way into him who is the head, as Paul says it. We who believe in Jesus are being prepared for the day when the veil between heaven and earth is finally torn away and God wipes away every tear and the great marriage supper of the Lamb begins. And on that day, as Paul says, Jesus will present the church to himself in splendor and we will be unveiled together with him without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing, completely holy. I want to prove this to you with another image. Here's an apocalyptic photograph from my own life. Here I am in 1994, arguably at my prime. I could still run fast, I could still dance well, I could still do calculus, I could still play the French horn in the marching band. This was about the best I ever was. And here's how I look. Pretty glorious, right? <laughs> well, let me show you the rest of the picture, the bigger and better apocalypse. This is my real glory here in the second picture. I've never looked better than this. And it's because of the beauty of my glorious spotless bride. First photo may have been apocalyptic in the disaster sense, but this one is apocalyptic in the best sense. My unveiling wasn't complete until you saw my truly better half. Thanks. Hi. The same way the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, begins with what we may think is the full picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus at his best. After we see Jesus with hair like wool and eyes of fire and a tongue that is a two-edged sword, well, what could top that? In fact, there is more. There is something better than that. This is not the climax, seeing Jesus in this way. Jesus is not fully unveiled until we see him with his bride. The full glory of the bridegroom is the bride. Without her by his side, Jesus remains partially hidden. Or here's the way our friend Peter Lightheart puts it, and we're indebted to him for helping us understand this book. His commentary is so valuable, and we'll be referring to him throughout this series. Lightheart says, contrary to the popular summary, the message of Revelation is not Jesus wins. Because when Revelation begins, Jesus has already won. He is already glorified. He has already received his kingdom. The message of Revelation is this. We win. We win by faithful witness and song. And in triumphing through Jesus, we receive the kingdom. So that's where we're headed in this series. Because Jesus has already won, we who follow him can be certain of this glorious, happy ending as well. Which brings us back to the question of how, how can we make use of this book during this time of pandemic? And three things are offered to us in this chapter that I just want to point out to you in closing. Three ways to make use of this book moving forward. Worship, word, and witness. I'll just say a brief bit about each one of these. First of all, regarding worship, our first response to this, this book of Revelation uh, to what is unveiled is to worship the Lord, just as John did when he saw, the Je saw Jesus in glory. He fell down at his feet as if dead. Our response ought to be the same. Uh, as we see in verses 5 and 6, there is a threefold description, not only of uh, what Jesus looked like, but also of what he did. We saw in the sevenfold description what he looks like. Now, see what he did in verses 5 and 6, where John reminds us Jesus is supremely worthy because of his actions in Good Friday, Easter, and Ascension. In verse 5, Jesus is the faithful witness or martyr. That's the Greek word for witness. Jesus was the first and greatest Christian martyr. 
put to death on Good Friday because he came as a witness for us. But Jesus didn't remain in the grave, as John goes on to say in verse 5. On Easter, Jesus was also the firstborn from the dead, having risen to eternal life. And then lastly, he's the ruler of the kings on earth, verse 5. He ascended to the throne to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. No one else is more worthy of our worship, which begins with lifting up praises to him in our words and our songs. That's what John goes on to do the end of verse 5 and into 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's the first way to make the most of this book, by worshiping Jesus. John does it by praising Jesus for who he is and for what he's done. And by the way, if this is something that's new to you, if you're new as a worshiper of Jesus, let us know. We'd love to send you some resources to help you become more of a worshiper and follower of him. So another way, in addition to worship, that we can make the most of this book is through the Word. The blessing of the Word is highlighted in this chapter as well. Look at verse 3, which contains the first of seven benedictions in the book of Revelation. Seven benedictions or blessings. And it says in verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is at hand. Blessing is what we all long for all the time, but especially right now during this catastrophe. To some degree or another, we're all experiencing a lot of anxiety as we're having to live through uncertainty. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my loved ones? What's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to school? What's going to happen to work? All of these kinds of questions are plaguing us. It causes stress day and night. How should we order our days in such a way as to bring order out of the chaos. And the answer really comes from receiving this first blessing in the book of Revelation, which we do by hearing and obeying the word of God. John wrote this book as an encyclical, a, a, a book that was supposed to be passed around as a letter to different churches to be read aloud in church and then to be uh, obeyed, to be followed. And now we're a part of that great tradition that began with John and is now passed all the way down to us. Thanks especially to Sulmani for reading for us today um, this passage. We are a part of the transmission of this, this book down to us today. But take care you don't become like the person that James warns about in his letter, the one who listens and then forgets, like looking into a mirror and then walking away and forgetting what you look like. Rather, as James says, be both a hearer and a doer of the word. So, blessed is the one who hears and keeps what is written in God's word. This is the blessing that comes from following Jesus, whose voice is like the sound of many waters, whose feet are like burnished bronze. He's the commander-in-chief who never lies, who is always trustworthy, and what he says is always good advice, always worth following. It always leads to maturity and eternal life. Finally, here's a third way to make the most of the book of Revelation. We worship Jesus, uh, the blessing of his word, and finally, witness. Jesus was a faithful witness, the first martyr uh, in Christianity. And because he first came as a witness or martyr, dying the death that he died. We who believe in him need not fear death, for he will raise us from the dead and we'll share life with him in eternity in the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the meantime, we're part of this great tradition, the transmission of the story, uh, part of those who receive and hear and put into practice what we find in this book. And I want to just point out one more time as we close what's found in verses 1 through 3 with the transmission of the story. Look one more time with me at how it begins. The apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which he made known by sending his angel to his slave or servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. 
Once again, contrary to popular opinion, this apocalypse of Jesus is not some great secret that is meant to be kept hidden until the end of the world. It's in fact the opposite. It's the unveiling, the uncovering, the revealing of Jesus and his bride in glory. It's something Jesus intentionally gave to John through this messenger who turns out to be the Holy Spirit, as we'll find out later. The messenger carries it to John, and then John writes it down so that the Spirit can carry it to us, to the churches, and we can be a part of this ongoing chain of transmission. He's told to write it down and circulate it amongst the churches. John does that. And then he adds the benediction for those who will, in fact, read it, listen to it, and do it. As we'll see again and again and again as we continue to read it, this doing of it involves extending the transmission line, adding additional witnesses to the chain, down through the generations, out across all the nations, so that everyone, everywhere, receives this benediction, this blessing of Jesus unveiling. The ultimate goal is that the whole earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Do you get it? This is what we really need. We need this unveiling of the Lord Jesus in his glory, the unveiling of his bride. It's what we need right now. It's what our neighbors need right now. It's what the whole world suffering in sin and death needs right now. This unveiling of Jesus and his bride is a way forward out of the storm and into safe harbor. It shows us a table, a feasting, with seats that are still open. And it invites people to come to be with the Lord, to be a part of this marriage supper, and to be safe and whole forever with Him. It's really good news. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this word. And thank you for the hope that we find at the end of the story. Thank you that the story ends with a very happy ending and that you invite us to be a part of it. Give us faith to believe and eyes to see. And then help us, Lord, to share this good news. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.